My name is Adam Jackson and over this run-up to the 2019 election I really wanted to meet some of the MPs and some of the candidates running in the election in my local town of Norwich and around in Norfolk. Today I've got with me Catherine Rowett. Uh, Catherine's a bit special because not only are you the candidate for, South Nor for Norwich South, you're also a member of the European Parliament as well, right? That's right, yes, I got elected in May for the Green Party uh, for the Eastern Region, that, that's six counties. It, um, so, um, so in a in a few lines, what is the, who are the Green Party? Well, the Green Party ha have stood for a long time for ecological and environmental projects, but also for a um, a total political um, stand for fairness, justice, awareness of the global needs uh, of those who are less fortunate. Um, so it was at one stage called the People Party, not because it's interested in popular vote, but rather because it's interested in uh, the needs uh, and benefits of real people. But of course we're also interested in the needs and benefits of the non-human uh, inhabitants of this planet and indeed of the planet as a, as a whole. What would you say is the most important, I could probably guess this one, what do you think is the most important uh, issue at stake? Well, the most important issue is the climate crisis, and that has finally got onto everybody's radar, I think. Uh, not, not that every party has actually taken on board the level of commitment that you need in order to address it, but everybody is now talking about it, uh, and they're talking about it trying to catch up with where we were 20, 30 years ago. Before um, it was cool. <laughs> before, well, it, it has been cool on, a, uh, on occasion and what we need to ensure is that it doesn't get dropped again this time because uh, when, when you get a government that does, couldn't care about it, they will bring in various things like austerity that make people actually unable to afford to live responsibly. Uh, you get poverty, uh, you get deprivation, you get people struggling to make ends meet and when that happens uh, the first thing that goes is their commitment to ethical living. Oh, that's interesting. I know that it's, uh, the Green Party you're talking about the Green New Deal is like the big thing yes. on the table. What, um, what is that exactly? So the Green New Deal is uh, a scheme worked out actually in the wake of the 2008 uh, financial crash and it was worked out in collaboration between the Green Party and uh, some people in the Labour Party. Uh, Caroline Lucas was involved, Clive Lewis was involved. Uh, and the idea is to rebuild a flourishing, uh, vibrant society with good jobs but the good jobs will not be in the old fossil fuel industries which need to be wound down, but will be more in uh, technology and renewable energy, in um, insulation of houses, building good, good housing stock, um, preparing us for uh, the kinds of new forms of agriculture, better agriculture, getting rid of the intensive farming and so on. So a lot of reform of the whole way in which we expect our jobs and our economy to work and judging the economy uh, partly on whether it delivers fairness and justice in this transition to a different way of living, more public transport, better green public transport, um, and so on. Uh, so partly we partly judge it on how um, well we can transition to that without disadvantaging anybody. In fact, it will be an advantage. Uh, and partly on whether it delivers uh, good climate change um, policies. So you're talking about the uh, the deintensification of agriculture. Yes, um, which is so one of the most important things actually. Ah, okay, so what uh, so what are the Green Party uh, generally? What what does the Green Party going to be able to offer um, the countryside? Uh, so the most uh, worrying thing in um, in the countryside. Well, there are many worrying things. Obviously, there's uh, there's the increase in roads and building of houses on green spaces. Mm. The uh, loss of biodiversity and so on. But part of the loss of biodiversity. Uh, and uh, insect species and so on is due to intensive um, crop growing uh, and the other problem in this area is intensive 
meat production and particularly poultry farms and things like that. Oh, that's really nice, uh, so factory farming um, and the pesticides uh, and the fertilizers uh, and the destruction of the soil. So one of the things is that the soil should contain a lot of carbon matter. Uh, good soil um, contains a variety of nutrients. Uh, and it's been shown that our food has fewer and fewer nutrients and that's one of the reasons why we're so unhealthy, heart disease and so on goes with, uh, it's not enough to give the, the crops nitrogen. Mm. They need a much more diverse, rich soil. Mm. And our soils are being depleted, they're running off, uh, that's part of the problem with flooding and so on. So a whole lot of stuff has gone wrong because we're farming by um, monoculture, the same crops over and over again, never putting any organic matter into the soil. So it's being a bit easier going with, uh, so letting yields yeah. drop and, and yields, encouraging that. Yes, that's right. Uh, yields need to drop uh, and um, traditional methods need to be used uh, and not, um, and we can't pin our hopes on just growing more and more of this kind of stuff. There's the, the Green Party nationally have announced uh, they want to build uh, 200,000 council houses or, or affordable yes. houses every year. So to put it in perspective, Norwich, you probably already know, has 96,944 houses in it. So that's nearly, um, uh, yeah, that's nearly mm. four Norwiches every year yes. for indefinitely, I presume. Uh, I mean, who do you vote for if you want to conserve things? Yes, well I think you, you do vote for the Green Party because one of the problems that's happened with the um, so-called Conservative Party is that they have uh, forced uh, councils into a position where they have to sell um, some of their assets including green space around the, the cities for development for really expensive things and, and, and uh, for business units and so on, not, not for the kind of housing that people actually need. Uh, but in order to um, make good the loss of funds from the cuts in government and central government funding. So the councils mm -hmm. have actually had to sell to developers, partly in order to get um, money for roads, because they usually build into the planning application some requirement that the developers will put in whatever junction it is that's required because they can't afford to do it themselves and partly because they just can't afford to do the social care that they're required to do so they have to sell um, public assets mm. to developers. So what we would be doing would be looking more for brownfield sites, there will be lots of brownfield sites because many <coughs> industries that have in the past been um, located in um, urban areas, they won't be required anymore. Some of the some of the uh, kind of um, businesses that that were um, fossil fuel based and so on. Uh, that's interesting. But in an, in addition, so the other thing that has precipitated this, of course, is the sale of of council housing into the private sector, mm. uh, and the um, uh, the amount of m public money that goes into supporting the rents of tenants who are on housing benefit but are renting in the private sector. So one of our projects is to get more um, council owned housing and the the new development in Norwich um, that's won all the awards for the uh, high level of passive house standard uh, insulation and so on. This is the sort of archetype of, of the kind of housing that we're thinking of. So you would have super good housing and it would be in the, in the council um, property uh, portfolio uh, and um, ordinary people would be able to afford to live there. And that sounds great, it, but going back to four cities the size of Norwich every mm. year mm. and um, and talking about um, so talking about developing on on brownfield sites. I know that in the yes. UK there are seven hundred thousand um, potential properties that can be developed to that are empty at the minute. Yes. And uh, but with that, it's only three and a half years worth, mm. and, and many, mm. many, many of those are not. It's not viable to develop them up. Uh, how how is it possible to do this without? So I'm not green sure space? whether we really need to build that many. To be honest, I, I've seen figures that suggest that actually all we need to do is bring into use. Uh, the massive mm. numbers of properties, for example, in London, 
uh, that are owned by oil tycoons and kept empty simply as investment properties. Mm. And if you actually filled those with the people who need housing in London, uh, for one thing, you could cut the number of people trying to commute to London, which would be a vast, <laughs> uh, vast improvement for their lives and also uh, from the from the carbon footprint point of view. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're, you're talking, I don't want to go down this yes. route, but you're talking about uh, forced repossessions of houses. Well, I think, you know, uh, I, I, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to tell people who've kept their house as an investment empty uh, that if they are still not letting it out two years down the line, then some of the homeless people will be uh, <laughs> put in it. Why not? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> You were just saying there about uh, about releasing some of the housing actually would be enough well, uh, to solve the housing crisis. Is that right? Well, so what what's the cause of the housing crisis? Um, I presume uh, it's too many people, like uh, too much supply and not enough demand. Oh, too much demand. Too much and not demand and not enough supply. Because um, uh, there's an interesting point there. Because uh, the Green Party are, um, uh, we'll come on to in a minute the, the mm. humane migration um, yes. uh, treaty, which yes. at the minute, which I presume under a Tory government, I imagine the Greens would have a, a more open door policy towards migration. And uh, and at the minute we're talking about um, three hundred thousand so, net contribution, mm. which then is uh, two or three times every year mm. the city the size of Norwich. So, um, so <laughs> yes. So, so freedom of movement goes both ways, and we have a lot of British people who go and live abroad. Of course, if they, if they all came back, as they may have to do mm -hmm. if we leave the European Union, then we've got a vast problem of um, housing take, taking in all those thousands uh, mm -hmm. who who are living abroad at the moment, uh, especially in the European Union. Um, and that's quite a good point, I suppose. Uh, but the the net contribution of migration, just on legal migration. So, uh, so I just want to go back to the to the question. So, what is the cause of migration, right? So, at the moment, the cause of migration is inequality, mm. uh, the inequality of opportunity across uh, a the globe and b the European Union. So, if there is there are uh, jobs to be had here and not in Romania, for example. Um, then the the professionals looking for jobs will come here. So mm. one one way to to um, solve that is what the EU needs to do, which is ensure that there's proper redistribution of wealth across the European Union. So uh, so the the UK has had this a really unhealthy attitude to the European Union, where it expects that it should get out from the European Union at least as much as it puts in, in money. Mm. Well, the point of the EU is actually to enable us as a, as a community of nations to try to deliver something where we raise the standards in all the nations of the EU to an equal level of prosperity so that we become a level playing field where everybody is as well off as the others. So a really wealthy late nation like ours should be gladly contributing uh, m more, like a taxpayer, a glad and willing taxpayer is glad to help the NHS so that the poorer people who are, are sick get a chance mm. uh, to be treated. Glad to contribute to the education so that ordinary poor children who couldn't pay fees can have an education. So you pay your uh, taxes to enable uh, those people to have a good life. And so also the EU needs to ensure that the, um, the opportunities and the development and the wages and so on are just as good in Eastern Europe as they are in, uh, Western, in yeah. Western Europe, uh, just as good in the, <coughs> in the Mediterranean countries as here. And then the, the only reason for people to move in one direction or another wouldn't be weather. desperation. <laughs> yeah, and then we'd all, we'd all go to <laughs> Spain, right? <laughs> um, uh, so, so that's one of the reasons for uh, internal migration. The other, of course, is that we haven't been training our own people mm. to do the professional jobs like nurses and so on. We've been uh, helping ourselves to ready-trained mm. doctors and nurses uh, paid for by other countries, and that's another aspect of our feeding like a parasite mm. on the European Union. And now people say, oh, well, how will we exist if we don't have farm workers and we don't have nurses? Mm. 
from the EU. Well, how, yes. maybe there was something slightly wrong with the way we were doing it before. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that sounds like that's a that is a beautiful vision for uh, for the European Union. I, I suppose mm. I can kind of picture uh, certain people being like, well. I don't. I don't feel wealthy myself to be able to do this. Though I know the country, you know, the GDP is technically higher. Mm. Like, but if you're struggling to to feed your family and you got uh, and you're on yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, we're not time. talking about ordinary people. I mean, you, we pay a, a pittance. Each each of us pays a very very little mm. to be for all the privileges that go with being in the European Union. All the free healthcare when we travel. Uh, all the opportunities for getting jobs, uh, studying uh, for free in all the countries of, of Europe and we and we pay something like a cup of coffee a week or something uh, but um, uh, but in any case it's not evenly spread the cost and it's mm. not like it's going to fall upon uh, the the, uh, the the people at the lower ranks of society this is what I'm talking about is the bankers who are earning billions right billionaires we've got billionaires in this country so what's the Green Party spending uh, looking like for the NHS because it looks like everyone's wanting to spend a lot of money on everything particularly the NHS where, where are you guys at yes yes obviously we want to spend a lot on the NHS uh, I forget the figures exactly but I think it's sort of seven billion or something like that I um, think it is seven billion yes which is interesting because the Conservative Party, who you'd think would be more um, small government, are, have already pledged 6.2 billion, I think, this year, and uh, are with a, a pledge of something like 30. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, add on. I mean. And Labour even more. Is that right? I thought Labour were a bit. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> I haven't got the manifest, yeah, manifesto too. in front of me. Uh, but um, here are some of the things uh, that we need to, to do for the NHS. We need to bring it back into public hands. So part of the reason why it costs so much uh, is that um, it's uh, a lot of the hospitals and so on were built under the um, new, new Labour government yeah. with private uh, finance initiatives. Mm. So those things are constantly uh, taking money from that uh, appears to be going into the NHS, but it's actually paying uh, the dividends. paying dividends mm. to the shareholders. Um, so I'm pretty sure our our um, contribution is higher because the 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 Conservatives have said something. Which they say it's the biggest, but it's absolutely not the biggest contribution to the, to the NHS. That they're claiming it's bigger than ever before, but it's it's piffling compared with with what Labour and the Greens are. are yeah, I see. I, I think Labour's uh, policy on this were just like whatever they're going to spend, we're going to spend more. <laughs> I'm presuming a couple of other just quick things. I'm presuming that you're uh, against the expansion of Norwich and probably uh, Heathrow airports. Yes. And. Um, how do you feel about running against uh, Clive in this area? Because I would have thought Clive Lewis, of all people, would be would have a lot of stuff in alignment with the Green Party, especially with the Green New Deal with Caroline together. Yes. Um, why why bother? Uh, why bother? Well, um, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one is that um, uh, I think Clive's a, a great thing, uh, but he re belongs to the wrong party, uh, and some of the things that his party stands for. He, he shouldn't stand for and can't stand for uh, so what like um, so nuclear weapons uh, mm. nuclear um, electricity uh, they're pretty dodgy on expansion of airports so there are things that uh, there are some people who wouldn't be able to vote for that and those people will not vote for him and they should have the choice of voting uh, green Green came top in Norwich in the European elections. Mm. So when uh, Norwich people are asked straightforwardly in a proportional system what they would like, they would like Green. So it would be absolutely nonsense not to give them a highly respected uh, in individual to... I'll say that myself. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they need somebody uh, who will represent the, the position that they mm. stand for in public during the debates in the um, uh, in the run up to the election, so that somebody is actually showing that the Green Party is as good or better than what they're offered by mm. Clive. Um, okay. and, and the third thing is that uh, were people to 
be unwilling to vote um, Labour uh, and pro-Europe, then they shouldn't have to vote Liberal Democrat in Norwich because in Norwich people tend mm. to vote either Labour. They used Green. to be the second target seat, didn't it? At Norwich South, we're after Brighton. And uh, well, it has been very successful, yes, but since Clive, uh, because Clive is so green himself, mm. uh, it's it's been um, not something that we would be aiming to, you know, to get. It, it, it's, if we're going to have Labour, we would like Clive Lewis to be in there, <laughs> right? <laughs> you heard it here first. So if you could speak directly to the electorate today, what would you say? I would say that this is the most important election and that if we don't get it right this time uh, things are going to be rather scary. But they're not scary yet uh, and now is the moment to make sure that it all turns out all right. Okay. You've been watching Catherine Rowett uh, from the Green Party, uh, the candidate for South Norwich 2019 on Adam Asks Political Special.